And welcome to this edition of the Biker Angle. It's 11-13 of 2018, and it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Yeah, well, who am I kidding, man? It's freaking cold as freak up here in Illinois. But uh, today's show, we got a good one for you. We're actually going to premiere a new segment that uh, we're calling the America the Brave. We figured that a lot of bikers talk about freedom, and it's time to uh, put it right in front of them and uh, give them the reason why we have the freedom. Uh, also on the show, we got Ask Hollywood that's coming up, and we got some good questions uh, on that segment. I actually took a peek before uh, actually letting the producer put them on because I am getting sick and tired of those other questions coming in. Anyway... Today's uh, title is actually Pagan's MC 1%er Outlaw Motorcycle Club Documentary Pittsburgh. The reason why I put that title on there was because I wanted to give, because uh, a lot of people that come to the channel don't understand what motorcycle clubs are, the bike lifestyle, you know, they're greenbacks as I call them. So it's easier to put it in them terms than it is, you know, our terms, if you will. So all those that are just coming into the channel and subscribing, welcome aboard. This is not PC, so if you're easily offended, you might want to leave now. <laughs> but our first story today is we got a uh, video just came out and regarding uh, the Pagans. And the Pittsburgh brawl over at Colby's. Well, it really wasn't a freaking brawl. It was the freaking cops that uh, started it. Everybody's seen the video, and the pagans weren't even fighting back. You know, usually you have to have a, you know, for a brawl, you have to have people fighting back. But it seems the DA is coming out saying that the cops are hiding evidence, that they're not cooperating. And that was one of the reasons why the DA postponed a couple hearings. I guess it's going to the U.S. Attorney's Office. Well, I guess the DA's getting a little taste of what we have to go through all the damn time in the biker community with how cops are. Uh, so let's take a look at that uh, video real quick. Involving undercover police officers and members of a motorcycle gang. He calls it troubling and says he believes police are withholding evidence. Paul Martino has more. We learned today why the district attorney postponed a hearing for four members of the Pagan motorcycle gang who were brawling with undercover Pittsburgh police officers two weeks ago. I have a problem with that. You're not, you're not talking about controlling the situation, you're talking about trying to hurt somebody. The district attorney is highly critical of how police handled this brawl and how they're handling the investigation. First off, Zapala says police have withheld evidence. Most of the surveillance video wasn't handed over until today, two weeks after the skirmish. These are the videos. When my assistant went down to City Court, we had one, we had one disc. And I don't know what kind of game these guys are playing. This is serious stuff. And that's one of the reasons I want to talk to the U.S. Attorney. Zapala still hasn't gotten body cam video from the uniformed officers, and he questions whether or not the undercover officers were really on duty. I don't know that they're undercover. I don't know why they're in the bar. We haven't heard from the supervisor that they were on duty. We haven't heard from a supervisor who the target was. There was, in fact, a target. And finally, the DA says, if those cops were really undercover, they shouldn't have been drinking for hours, as the video apparently shows. They shouldn't be drinking at all. If you are going to take a drink, you go to the bathroom with your, with your cup and you pour it out. And you come back with water or whatever. Zapala is so concerned about this brawl at Kopi's Bar on the south side that he has gone to the U.S. attorney to determine if there may have been a civil rights violation and if there's some sort of violation for interfering with the district attorney's investigation. And involving well, you've seen that right there. Even the district attorney can't even get anywhere with these cops. Welcome to the blue wall. <laughs> this guy seems stunned that the cops are doing this kind of bullshit. But uh, in all seriousness, this is a serious issue because we're seizing a, seeing a rise and what the police are doing to club members. And you got a lot of people out there that it, it's really funny. They'll go off on the internet or some shit like that and say, well, you know, they're just getting what they're, you know, giving and shit like that. Well, <laughs> 
first it's them, and then it's going to be you is what I have to tell you. So, uh, But we're going to keep you abreast of what's going on with the situation as we get more news or more information. We'll put it out there for you. But again, we just put out an article on Insane Throttle Biker News. It has to deal with the Mongol situation. It lists uh, emails and phone numbers that you can get involved and uh, help make some noise and let these people know that no, we're not all right with them trying to take a club's trademark, whoever they are. Who you know, it don't matter if you like them or you don't like them. Uh, get on that email and stuff, because the next it could be you. But right now we are gonna go to the legend segment of the program. Here we go. Penn Night Horse Campbell, U.S. Senator fighting for motorcyclist rights on the national level. U.S. Senator Ben Night Horse Campbell's myriad of accomplishments span both his public and private life, and central to both is his advocacy of motorcycling and motorcyclist rights. It is his passion and achievements in the world of motorcycling that earned him his place in the AMA Motorcycling Hall of Fame. Born in Auburn, California, April 13th, 1933, Campbell attended public school and served his country in the U.S. Air Force during the Korean War, where he earned the Korean Service Medal and the Air Medal. He returned to the U.S. in 1953, earned a B.A. in Physical Education and Fine Arts at California State University at San Jose, 1957. He also attended University in Tokyo, Japan as a research student between 1960 and 64. Campbell became a three-time U.S. Judo champion, winning the gold medal in the Pan American Games in 1963, and was captain of the U.S. Olympic Judo team in the 64 Summer Olympics in Tokyo. Later, he coached the U.S. International Judo team. Campbell later achieved notoriety as a Native American jewelry designer. Campbell served as both a representative and senator from Colorado, having first been elected to Congress. As a Democrat in 86, he served three terms in the House and two terms in the Senate, during which he changed from the Democrat to Republican Party in 95. During his long tenure in U.S. Congress, Campbell was recognized motorcyclist as ardent and passionate champion for motorcycling. He was well known not only for his accomplishments in the legislative area, but also his western dress, his ponytail, and above all, his Harley Davidson. While serving in Congress, he made time to participate in numerous motorcycle rides and activities, and was the motorcycling community's strongest advocate and best friend on Capitol Hill. In 95, Campbell led a successful effort to repeal penalties for those states that do not have mandatory helmet laws. After years of work building support for the issue, he spent over 16 hours leading a debate on the Senate floor that resulted in a vote to repeal the federal helmet law provision and vote to kill an amendment that would have denied benefits to unhelmeted riders who were injured. While in Congress, Senator Campbell spoke out against insurance companies denying coverage to motorcyclists, defended the right of motorcyclists to use HOV lanes, supported funding for motorcycle safety, urged that the development of intelligent transportation systems took motorcyclists' needs into consideration, and fought to ensure that motorcyclists could not be denied access to highway or road that use federal highway funds for planning, construction, or maintenance. As a rancher, Campbell was a staunch supporter of private property rights and multiple use of public lands. During the heated debate over protection of the California desert, he fought to keep millions of acres of desert open to off-road motorcyclists. He was also the original co-sponsor of the legislation to establish the Recreational Trails Program that since its passage in 91, has provided hundreds of millions of dollars for motorized and non-motorized trail projects in every state in the nation has resulted in development and maintenance of thousands of motorcyclist trails. Campbell rode with Rolling Thunder many times in its Washington, D.C. annual Memorial Day weekend ride to the wall 
to remind the city and the nation of the thousands of POWs and MIAs who remain unaccounted for. He is an honorary member of Rolling Thunder. He was also an early supporter of a Colorado POW MIA recognition ride, which he led for a decade, served as guest speaker, and vigorously promoted. Campbell also served as a Grand Marshal of the March of Dimes Bikers for Babies event in Colorado. In 94, he was honored with the AMA Brighter Image Award, the association's highest award for activities that generate good publicity for motorcycling. After leaving the Senate in 2004, Campbell went to the law firm of Holland and Knight. Campbell was inducted into the AMA Motorcycle Hall of Fame in 2002. And that's your legends in the motorcycle scene. If you got anybody you'd like to have featured in the legends of the motorcycle scene, go ahead and email us at cubbiesrock1973 at gmail.com. That has become a very popular segment here on the Biker Angle. And uh, the next one, we're hoping it will be too. So no better way to uh, premiere this next segment than on Veterans Day a day that uh, we honor all those that have served our country. And uh, it's just the cream of the crop that we have here in the United States is our vets. So let's take a look at America the Brave and let me know in the comment sections what do you think of this new segment. Gunnery Sergeant John L. Canley, United States Marine Corps, gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty in action against the enemy while serving as Company Gunnery Sergeant Alpha Company, 1st Battalion, 1st Marines, 1st Marine Division, from 31 January to 6 February 1968 in the Republic of Vietnam. Alpha Company fought off multiple vicious attacks as it rapidly moved along the highway towards Hughes City to relieve friendly forces that were surrounded by enemy. Despite being wounded in these engagements, Gunnery Sergeant Canley repeatedly rushed across fire-swept terrain to carry his wounded Marines to safety. After his commanding officer was severely wounded, Gunnery Sergeant Canley took command and led the company into Hughes City at Hughes City, caught in deadly crossfire from enemy machine gun positions. He set up a base of fire and maneuvered with a platoon in a blinking attack that eliminated several enemy positions. Retaining command of the company for three days, he led attacks against multiple enemy fortified positions while routinely braving enemy fire to carry wounded marines to safety. On 4th of February, he led a group of marines into an enemy occupied building in Hughes City. He moved into the open to draw fire. Located the enemy, eliminated the threat, and expanded the company's hold on the building room by room. Gunnery Sergeant Canley then gained position above the enemy strong point and dropped in a large satchel charge that forced the enemy to withdraw. On 6 February, during a fierce firefight at a hospital compound, Gunnery Sergeant Canley twice scaled the wall and fueled view of the enemy to carry wounded Marines to safety. By his undaunted courage, selfless sacrifice, and unwavering devotion to duty, Gunnery Sergeant Canley reflected great credit upon himself and upheld the highest tradition of the Marine Corps and the United States Naval Service. And that's our America the Brave segment. Let me know your thoughts in uh, the description box, your comments. Let me know what you think of that one. Uh, come this Saturday! Little over four days away, we go worldwide on multiple platforms. We'll be over on Facebook. We'll be on you now. We'll be here on YouTube. We'll be everywhere. So this chat room is going to be filled, and hopefully uh, you guys have a good time during that uh, show. Uh, right now, let's go to Ask Hollywood, everybody's favorite uh, part of the show. Cobra 6, what is expectable prospecting time? Acceptable, I guess. 
Uh, well, it's up to the club. It ain't up to me. Uh, you know, most, uh, you know, the normal ones are six months to a year plus uh, a couple months hang around time. It all depends what club you're in. But most of the time, they'll just tell you shut up. And uh, when you get it, you get it. <laughs> Next, why submit to a dominant? Who did they ask for permission? Biking is about freedom, not being judged. Why can't someone start a club? Because someone thinks they're being disrespected if they don't ask. You're crucifying these bikers for doing something they dominance didn't want to do. You jump police for being bad cops, and you should. They should actually be held to a higher standard than the rest of society, you think? But if a dominant does something in what you consider being disrespectable, you go on a rant about how they are here to keep law and order, cops of some sort. Let's be fair across the board and tell it is not how you want it to be. Well, the first thing to your question is why submit to the dominant? A lot of people don't understand how the club scene works. A lot of, you know, and I'm not talking about uh, this dude with the question or whatever, but you got a lot of rubs or you got a lot of these weekend warriors who think they just can go out there, buy a Harley Davidson, buy all the leather goodies with it, get all the accessories, and go out and make a name for themselves and put it on a patch. Well, that shit's not how it works, man. This is the real world. This ain't the liberal tree hugger fantasy freaking world that a lot of these uh, people want to believe. No, it's a different kind of ball game on the street, man. And it does come down to the streets. And for people who don't have the understanding of the streets, you will get questions kind of like the this one. Or you get a lot of people out there saying, well, why can't we do this? Why can't we do that? Well, this is the way the shit's been for over 50, 60 freaking years. And the tradition has been built up. And yeah, those dominants have paid for what the fuck they've done. Uh, let's see here. Why can't, or what, not being judged, blah, blah, blah. Who did they ask for permission? Well, that is a question right there. If you know motorcycle history, is they paid for it in sweat, blood, and tears. That's how they paid for it. Uh, that's how, you know, let's take the Mongols, for example. Now, the Mongols are one of the big five uh, clubs. And in the 60s, uh, or I think it was late 60s, 70s, well, you know, the 81 didn't want them wearing some shit. So, yeah, they had to fight for the fucking, uh, what they got right now, man. They had to go out there on the streets, beat the street, and put in the work to get the reputation they have now. So, yeah, they earned it. And, uh... What you're going to have a lot of other clubs out there, these pop-ups, when I say they earned it, they earned it. But these pop-up clubs out, no, they just want to throw on a patch and think they're entitled to do whatever the hell they want to do. Well, if that's the case, go out there and earn it. If you think you're the, all that, go earn it. You know, put in the work. Don't go and uh, advertise on the internet and try to get members and as soon as the first uh shit goes down to where you got to back your patch up you're running or you're handing it in you know <laughs> so uh let's see what else you got here you jump for police being bad well you know what cops are you know freaking cops and again if you know your history a lot of you guys are new jacks and a lot of you have not grown around. You didn't go through the scene in the early days. I'm talking seventies, eighties, early nineties. Cops were horrible, man. It was not cool to be a biker back then. It really wasn't cool to be a damn biker until what? 94, 95, when all these rubs started buying up the Harley Davidsons before then nobody wanted to be a biker. And that was because of all the shit that came along with it, man. You had profiling up the ass, and you had all kinds of cops causing freaking problems. And that's the reason why you don't want, you have bikers that don't like freaking cops. <laughs> They're assholes. You know, it's simple. It's their job to catch us doing what we're doing and our job not to get caught. So I hopefully that uh, answers your question. Uh, let's see here. But a dominant does something in what you consider being disrespected. You go on a rant. Well, yeah, they do keep a law and order. <laughs> Why you think you don't got a lot of these? Uh, well, you do got a lot of them nowadays. But in the old days, you didn't have a lot of these uh, 
idiot pop-up clubs going around causing all kinds of problems like they do now. Let me tell you, we deal with them all the time uh, on a daily basis because we see the shit worldwide of what is happening. But no, you don't have a right to wear a patch unless you back it up. It's just the way of the world, man. It's just reality. So hopefully I uh, answered that question for you. If not, uh, send me another one. We'll get it in there. But the uh, show's going great. And uh, like I said, this weekend we're going to be worldwide live on all different type of platforms. And we're actually thinking about adding a midweek show to the live program. But first we want to see how everything goes. Uh, Iron Order Motorcycle Club. Well, this is probably for the last guy who questioned. Uh, this is an in-depth look at the Iron Order. Some of the problems that have been caused since they've been around. And, uh, it's a critical look at them. I actually, being, I'm being called mean for the shit I say in the book. For one, you know, us Chicago guys, you know, we have that attitude problem. We have that vocabulary problem. But, uh... You know, this is a straight-on look. This is the actions that uh, they've been involved in since their inception. And, uh, yeah, it, it, I think it's a pretty damn good book, even though I wrote it. Uh, also, New Age Biking and Brotherhood. Don't forget to get that. We do have a holiday special, I think they're doing. Uh, two audio books uh, through Insane Throttle Publishing. I think they're like $7.99 or $8.99. For the both of them. So if you want to get the audio version of these books, they're over there on Insane Throttle Publishing. But with that, let me know your thoughts and all that shit uh, with the new segments. And I, uh, I'll see you tomorrow.